Good afternoon. I am Dr. Sudhya N. Kulkarni uh, from Janki Devi Memorial College, and I will be presenting the second unit of Importance and Challenges of Ethics, Part Two. The subtopic is on the diversity of uh, morals. Uh, before I get down to discussing about diversity of morals, I would just like to highlight briefly about cultural and ethical subjectivism. Now, it's a known fact that any ethical system based on human nature has to face stiff critical analysis. One of the reasons for this is cultural relativism. Now, across cultures, the definition of right and wrong, moral and immoral, is different. The divergent practices that exist across cultures are a prime example of it. Thus, one finds in some cultures it is all right for a widow to remarry, but in some it is forbidden. In some, polygamy is accepted, while in others there is a law against its practice. What these cultural differences demonstrate is that there is no definition of human nature, moral rules that is common across social groups. Furthermore, studies in anthropology and sociology have led us to accept cultural relativism or cultural diversities. There is no one culture, according to them, which can be seen as superior to others. Each culture makes sense, is sufficient unto itself within its own religious and philosophical presuppositions. According to the sociologists and the anthropologists, it is grossly unfair for one culture to arrogate to itself the right stand on judgment on another one. Even if one were to claim that he or she is not critiquing an alien culture from his or her standpoint, but from the fancied neutral ground of common human nature, still it is viewed as being naive. The reason that such an evaluation is frowned upon is because one is arguing from a position of understanding his or her own culture. However detached their viewpoint may seem to be, yet the views are not without a bias. In practical circumstances, however, it works out often enough that a dominant culture forces itself on less dominant ones and thereby it goes on to obliterate native or local ones in the process of cultural domination. Here we have to accept that not all cultural differences can be explained simply as a matter of difference in perception. Exploitation of cultures, persons, societies cannot be justified in the name of cultural differences alone. One will have to look at some moral laws or principles that serve as the foundation or groundwork of morality across cultures. Here, I would like to briefly discuss Kant's view of morality. The reason I want to do it, because oftentimes it is contrasted with cultural relativism, which talked about different cultural aspects that are spread across different cultures. So there is no one rule of morality or moral ethical values that is common across all cultures. Here, when we are discussing about Kant, Kant had a completely different view of morality. Now, Kant talked about uh, the concept of morality or moral law. And the reason that he mentioned was that there, it is often enough thought that, you know, whenever we are talking about a common natural law, moral law, it is often confused that it is the same as Kant's categorical imperative. It needs to be stated here that Kant's concept of the categorical imperative emphasized duty for duty's sake. In other words, no exceptions were entertained within the framework of the moral law. And like I would like to tell you earlier, Kant's view of morality is a presentation of a deontological view of ethics as against a consequentialist view of ethics. Kant was clear that in order to have universal and necessary moral laws, it is necessary to make them independent of any circumstances or source, be it God, be it the divine will or positive law. His agnostic epistemology, influenced by Hume, could not accept any principle of morality being based on human nature. So Kant, like I mentioned, was clear that in order to have universal and necessary moral laws, they had to be independent of circumstances. The reason being, if they were dependent on any circumstance, then they could not be objective, universal and necessary at the same time. 
Kant described the moral law as being synthetic a priori in nature. Now, whenever we are talking about a priori, it basically means that the moral law or the reasons for it are not dependent on experience. They are independent of experience. The reason being it was not derived from experience, yet it applied to rational human beings. Therefore, it was synthetic in nature because it applied to rational human beings. Human beings who have this reason that is being given to them by the divine will. And so he argued that the moral law is a synthetic a priori principle. The moral law, according to Kant, referred to the concept of duty, where duty meant a command or an action one was compelled to do. Kant made a clear distinction between the categorical imperative and the hypothetical imperative. Now, categorical imperative implied that the moral rules were not negotiable. For instance, murder is wrong is a categorical imperative. In other words, categorical imperatives were universal, necessary, and they applied across board to all citizens or to all people or to all human beings without any kind of biases coming in the way of its application. Kant believed that as rational beings, we understand and recognize the basic inherent dignity we all share. And this inherent dignity is recognized and acceptable only when it is based on reciprocal relationship. In other words, if I want to uphold my promise to you and you want me to uphold my promise to you, obviously it would imply that you will also have to uphold your promise to me. Therefore, it is based on a reciprocal relationship. In other words, if I want someone to respect me, then I do have to respect that person. Categorical imperative recognized three aspects of a rational being. A, we are all ends in themselves. Two, or B, we cannot be used as a means to further each other's ends. And we are all members of a commonwealth. And C, or three, it is these key elements that make any moral law to be a categorical imperative. In other words, for any moral law to be categorical imperative, it must recognize that all human beings are ends in themselves. We cannot be used as means to further each other's ends. And we are all members of a commonwealth. And in doing so, we not only recognize each other's inherent dignity and respect, but by doing so, we are also involved in a reciprocal relationship. Hypothetical imperatives, on the other hand, were flexible. They were neither necessary nor universalizable, like the categorical imperative. Kant recognized that there were certain ends or goals which we rational beings would aspire for and which may not be categorical in nature. For example, if I want to pursue studying music or if I want to pursue uh, being uh, you know, active with some NGO, those are certain hypothetical imperatives which may or may not be imposed upon anyone else and they are subject to an individual's likes or dislikes. Even though Kant distinguished between two types of imperatives, yet he was clear that the categorical imperative would always take precedence over the hypothetical one. Kant's theory may appear to be challenging, but we cannot deny the fact that Kant has acquainted us with our common human nature or our inherent rationality. This rationality can act as a guide while we decide or choose between principles of morality. The key features of this inherent rational nature are our capacity to transcend space and time. In other words, we understand that as sociable beings, we are not only connected with each other, but also with the ultimate reality. If only these aspects of our nature were to be highlighted, then we don't have to accept a single common principle of morality or view of things. In the light of such a perspective, Cultural differences can be explained as divergent viewpoints. One need not describe to the view that people from certain cultural backgrounds are inferior or non-persons. And it is in this context of cultural divergences that we will now examine the views of Morris Chinsberg. We've already examined the views of uh, uh, situational ethics of Fletcher. And now we are going to be discussing the views of Morris Chinsberg. Now we come to Diversity of Morals by Maurice Ginsberg. Maurice Ginsberg was a professor of sociology at the University of London from 1929 to 1954. And one year before his retirement, he delivered the Huxley Memorial Lecture. The lecture focused on the phenomenon of ethical relativism that sociologists and anthropologists were discovering in cross-cultural studies. 
After a long and detailed scrutiny of facts, Morris Ginsburg arrived at certain core features that model codes exhibit. Despite being varied, there are certain similarities between them. The point to be noted here is that no doubt moral codes are varied, they are different across cultures, yet despite those differences, there are certain similarities that can be highlighted across moral codes that are present across cross uh, cultures. These similarities between moral codes is evident from the fact that they all assert the following points. A. All societies have rules of conduct which have been approved of by its members. In other words, all societies, whatever be the nature of society, have certain rules of conduct which have been approved of or framed by the members of that society or social group. B. The basic tenet is those rules which safeguard and promote the needs of the members are to be respected and adhered to. In other words, all the members of that social group understand that the rules have been made in order to safeguard and promote not only their needs but also their interests and they have to be respected and adhered to. Obviously, if they were not to be respected and adhered to by each and every member, those rules will not serve any purpose. Further, all those codes of conduct which interfere with and threaten the social relations and stability of the group are to be con condemned. In other words, when we frame those codes of conduct, we have to see that they do not interfere or infringe or threaten the social relation that people in that social group have vis-a-vis -vis each other. Because if they were to do that, then the entire stability of that social group is going to be threatened. Therefore, such rules of conduct are to be discarded or condemned. Ginsburg, in fact, goes on to state, it might be argued, he says, that the diversity of moral judgments affords no more proof of their subjectivity than the diversity of judgments regarding matters of fact throws any doubt on the possibility of valid scientific judgments about them. Variations in moral practices. Ginsburg next mentions six different contexts wherein a certain variation in moral practices may be noted between and within certain nations and cultures. They are as follows. A. Variations that arise due to the applicability of the moral norms or rules. In other words, to whom do they apply? Now, when Ginsburg is talking about the variations in moral practices, what he is talking about is that despite there being differences, there are certain contexts within which we will find that there are variations when the moral rules are applied across certain nations and cultures. So the first one is to whom does it apply? The second is the variation that arises due to the difference of opinion as to what qualities are moral, what qualities are non-moral. So moral or non-moral qualities of certain acts and their consequences. Third, variations that arise from the fact that the same act appears to be seen differently in different situations and contexts. In other words, variations that arise from the fact that the same action or same act may appear to be seen differently in different situations and contexts. Fourth, variations that arise due to a difference of emphasis on different elements of moral life. Each and every aim or goal of moral life has a different emphasis. So on the basis of that emphasis too, one will find that variations will arise across cultures. Variations that arise from the possibility of the alternative ways of satisfying primary needs. How are the primary needs of the members satisfied across social groups will also lead to variations and variations in the elements of moral life. Variations that arise due to differences of moral insight and the general level of development, ethical as well as intellectual. So these variations in moral practices will arise because of how evolved or intellectually developed is the society under which those moral aims are going to be applied to. Now we'll look at the six variations in detail. A. To whom do the moral rules apply? According to Taylor 
an anthropologist. Natural solidarity is an integral part of all societies. Initially, it was a neighbor that one was connected to. A neighbor was someone who belonged to the same tribe, clan and race. Now, Ginsburg here is highlighting the six variations in detail. The first is, whom are the moral rules going to apply? Initially, as the society started developing, as Taylor has pointed out, natural solidarity was integral to all societies. And basically, it was the neighbor that one was connected to. The neighbor could be somebody who belonged to the same tribe, he could be someone from the same clan, or even someone from the same race. But as time evolved, societies developed, it was clear that the neighbor implied all persons, irrespective of their age, sex, social status or nationality. Laws implied that no discrimination would be entertained against one's neighbor. Therefore, as the terminology of neighbor widened to include all kinds of persons, the laws also developed, the moral rules also developed to ensure that no discrimination would be entertained against one's neighbor which would be inclusive of all persons irrespective of the differences that may come about because of sex bias or gender bias or nationality or race or religion. Second is the difference that arises due to, due to the growth of knowledge that comes about regarding certain acts. Now here one can see that how the development in sociology and psychology has led to certain social practices to be shunned. What does this mean? Well, there are certain practices which over a period of time began to be shunned. Why? Because they were against ethical moral practices. And one of them was, of course, burning of witches, which of course was an extremely good practice. Because what did it ensure? It ensured that women would no longer be classified as witches and burnt alive. They were to be respected simply because they are human beings in their own right. So the growth of knowledge led to not only the development of sociology and psychology, but it also led to certain bad ethical practices or social practices to be shunned. Another practice which was followed up or which was developed was one of developing a sense of hygiene. How hygiene helped us in developing a society which would be cleaner and would lead to better medical health for all. Third, the same action is viewed differently in different cultures. Because different cultures have different perspectives, so the same action is viewed differently. Now, this is due to the fact that ethical laws are couched or covered in very brief formats and which it sometimes makes it difficult for us to understand what exactly is it that the ethical law is stating. So, the same action is deemed different across cultures, although it may appear to be the same. As an example, one can cite, and I am giving this example from James Rachel's book, where he talks about how in the Eskimos culture, female infanticide or female feticide is not frowned upon at all. Whereas across in India, we often find that one find, you know, one indulges in female feticide, which is a criminal act. Now, the reason that the Eskimos do not frown upon it is because A, they live in a very harsh environment. Two, the male is the main species, main person who goes about doing hunting, which, require, which requires great physical stamina because of that. In, and combined with the fact that there are more mouths to feed, so they have this practice of, you know, uh, doing female in, uh, feticide. But the reasons are different from the reasons that may be present, say, in India or in any other society where female feticide is practiced. So this would lead to, you know, the same action which is viewed, viewed differently in different cultures. Variations in moral responsibility. Even if there is universal agreement regarding right and wrong action, still we must know why are we doing certain actions and why are we not doing certain actions. Some reasons that may be given to explain why we should do good actions or do morally good actions and refrain from moral or evil actions, immoral actions is because it may be the will of the God or because it may lead us to attain salvation or it may lead us to attain beatitude. So there are these variations in moral responsibility. Now, according to Gisberg, 
The reason for doing right actions should not be because of any divine or extra worldly reasons. The reason for choosing to do right has to be dependent on the fact that we want to cultivate a spirit of self-criticism. Ethical relativism is therefore just another perspective of looking at moral norms. It cannot be blamed for these divergences regarding moral rules or principles. It is the lack of critical self-analysis that is to be looked into. So if we highlight what Ginsburg is saying is that within ethical relativism, we are not to be criticism, critical of what ethical relativism is talking about when it says that there do exist divergent moral norms or practices across culture where we cannot say one is superior to the other. But what we have to focus on is that we have to indulge in critical self-analysis and look at the moral norms and practices that we are talking about or referring to. Variations that arise due to different ways of fulfilling the needs. Now, these variations arise because oftentimes there is agreement regarding the basic human needs, but different societies fulfill these needs in different ways. For example, most cultures recognize marriage as monogamous and accept that parental support is required for bringing up the children, whereas some cultures may have a completely different view and they may not believe in monogamy but rather in polygamy and there may be some cultures which may even be acceptable of polyandry. These values may be recognized across cultures but the manner in which they are fulfilled may be different. It is these different ways in which, say for example, marriage may be approached that different cultures throw up divergent practices. Instead of being critical of these divergent practices, it is important to recognize that no one culture is perfect and infallible or without any kind of mistakes. And there is a lot to learn from those that are different. Such exchanges prove to be beneficial to all parties and allow one to have an open mind. Five perspectives for judging variations. Divergences due to the particular level of mental development. Now, these are the five perspectives which help us in assessing why are there variations in moral practices across cultures. One could be due to the level of the mental development. The development of mental and therefore moral acumen may be gauged according to Ginsburg from five perspectives. Now, what are those five perspectives? A is universalism. What is the degree of universalism or universalization that a moral system is envisaging? This is to assess whether the moral code stops with the family, tribe, clan or whether it goes on to include rules governing how one should deal with the larger family, embracing people of all nations, ethnic groups, cultures, religions and making no discrimination on the basis of sex, age or religion. Second is the range of the moral code. This deals with how comprehensive and encompassing the moral code is. For example, a nomadic group will have a very limited access to moral codes. The reason is the exposure they have with the outside world. So their moral codes will definitely be restricted in their content and application. Such moral codes will not be able to provide guidance for economic interreligious relationships. Scrutiny of the moral codes. According to Ginsburg, it is very important to have a constant perusal, scrutiny of the moral codes to see how justified they are in their application. Are they coherent and do they also fit into one harmonious whole? Separation of moral codes from religion. This is essential if moral codes are to be independent of religion. If separation between the two is not clearly spelled out, it could lead to the dominant religion dictating the moral code. If such a situation were to arise, then all those who do not adhere to or follow that particular religion may end up getting ostracized and sidelined. Further, moral codes based on religion may not generate the same amount or degree of respect as codes based on analysis, universalism and impartiality. If moral codes are based on religion, then they will not provide space for individual decisions as everyone is expected to follow the religious code. Thus, non-separation of morality and religion 
hinders the growth of moral rules as well as individual decision making and is in the long run detrimental to the growth of human beings the law at no time should employ its machinery to oblige everyone to act even if they are not in agreement with the prescribed religion open to assessment and critical appraisal it is important for a moral systems to encourage and support self criticism and self direction systems that assume that adults are too immature to make their own religious and moral decisions are too narrow in their outlook such systems that refuse to tolerate even the mildest form of dissent even when presented with rational arguments is certainly inferior to one that allows for a public debate on complex issues seen in the context of contemporary development in social sciences such systems need to be overhauled let us sum up in this unit we have examined the main challenges to ethics as a sub discipline of philosophy that analyzes various moral theories and perspectives however some thinkers have put forward the view or the claim that ethical theories must be aware of divergent views regarding moral laws or principles subjectivism situational ethics and divergence in morals are three such challenges to ethics we have looked at each one of them in detail to come to the position held by jinsberg where he argues that one ought not to link industrial and technical advancement with moral enlightenment in the same perspective no assumption should be made that because people are socially aware and have access to social media therefore they will be critical a glaring example of lack of such cohesion is globalization under the tag of this development has proceeded along unethical lines this has resulted in rampant exploitation of all natural resources globalization has been presented as a model by those cultures whose pretensions to democracy and family values according to jensberg need to be questioned panikar suggested a diatopical exchange amongst cultures whereby they can learn from each other and grow together such an exchange will not only provide the much needed space for all cultures to grow and expand together without bringing in their biases this way all continue to learn and grow in an ethical manner without impacting nature in a harmful manner thank you so much i am dr sudhyan kulkarni associate professor department of philosophy janki devi memorial college university of delhi thank you